installerade och fyra klockor som registrerar allt han gör och han håller sig alltså ständigt uppkopplad. Jag har träffat honom. Welcome Chris Dancy to this morning show. I just have to start with uh, something a bit disturbing that you call me and like everyone else who's a bit addictive to their phones, a cyborg. Yeah. Uh, you have to explain that, but first, what is a cyborg? A cyborg is, first off, it's not bio-robotic. So when people hear cyborg, they sometimes think like a machine-human hybrid. A cyborg is an organism, and that just means anyone living, that is assisted through a piece of technology and depends on feedback. So glasses make you a cyborg, but they're missing the piece that depends on feedback. So they're not vibrating or telling you something's right or wrong. Because of everyone's use of technology, they've become cybernetic. Um, and what we're seeing right now is the rise of the cyborg. Mm -hmm. So if we just rewind a bit, you are called the most connected man on earth, yeah. often. <laughs> How and why? Good algorithms. Um, in 2008, I started uh, paying attention to what the computers, my computers knew about me. I noticed a lot of, like a lot of people, I was being served advertisements. And I thought to myself, I'm not very healthy right now. I just turned 40. It was 10 years ago. I wonder if these ads could tell me positive things about my life. So I started thinking about how I interacted with my laptop, my computer, my phone, my DVR. And I slowly started building a system that would take anything I did and show it back to me and suggest to me what I should be doing. So if I'd been at the computer for too long, maybe it would say, would you like to go for a walk? Or if I didn't email or call my mom, it would say, you probably should talk to your mom. So in the beginning, it was something very, very private. Shortly thereafter, I was at a conference and someone saw what I was doing and it was a reporter. And the first story came out about 2011, 2012. And I was called the world's most surveilled man. Shortly after that, I became uh, the world's most connected man by a mistake the BBC made. <laughs> and now I'm making it again. Well, it's fine. It's fine. It's, it, it's better than, uh, like my grandmother would say, at least you call me. <laughs> <laughs> but so it helped you gain your health back, right? Yes, ma'am. So yeah, when I was 40 in 2008, I was uh, about 300 pounds. I smoked two packs of cigarettes a day. Um, I was on medicine for blood pressure. Um, anxiety and depression, and I'd been on anxiety and depression medicine my entire life. So 22 years, I started when I was 18. Um, I was really, really unhealthy. And the idea was the computers I were using were still perfect. And I just wanted to reverse that a little bit. I find today it's, it's ironic that our phones are charged up, they're covered, they're protected, and they're the latest, but we're tired, cold, and hungry. So I just, I turned it around and started taking care of myself as well as I took care of my devices, using my devices. But if your devices like tell you to go for a walk and call your mom yeah. or something like that, do you ever think by yourself? Yes, ma'am. Um, the problem is we live in a world where our computers help us find places, find people, find things, and we forget how to think for ourselves. So once you get so far into technology, to your point, where you've forgotten to do simple things, you need the help to get back to do them. Just as someone who maybe had been in an accident needs rehabilitation, you know, they, you know, can you walk by yourself? Not yet, but I will. Uh, I was at a point where in 2008, I had used so much technology for so many years that I needed to teach myself to be more human. Mm -hmm. I'm also thinking that for for me and for some people, like uh, using the the mobile phones and devices all the time, makes you a bit stressed, and then you might have like to put them away to be mindful, like to yoga or whatever. But you use them to be more mindful. You call yourself a mindful. Cyborg. I call myself a mindful cyborg. Yeah. Well, again. Uh, I believe that it's, it's, first off, it's very important. If you feel you need to put your phone away to be more mindful, please do. The problem and why I advocate not to do that is because we live in a world where we've weaponized the use of technology. If I see you on your phone, the first thing I think is, why can't you pay attention to me, right? I don't consider that that might be your spouse, that might be your work, you might be checking your blood sugar, right? We make the assumption that people are being narcissistic when they use their devices, not the assumption that they're talking to other people. So for me, I understand the need for people to avoid technology. The reality is we live in a world where you can't. 
from what I understand, you also use notifications to be kind to other people, like yeah. walking into a grocery store and reminding yourself to be kind to, uh, to the people who work there. Yeah, I've noticed a disturbing trend in the world in the last three years. Our apps have allowed us to order ahead and just walk in and pick up things and leave. Our apps have also made payments very easy, so we just pay with our phones. And I think what I noticed in myself was the more I avoided people with technology, the more I was hostile. And what I found was using technology to remind me to engage with people actually was the antidote. So now when I walk in stores, I get messages, for specifically the grocery store, telling me to talk to everyone there. What do you think will happen next like in the relationship with technology and the world? And well, we're merging. I mean, this is kind of the message of my book, Don't Unplug. The reality is we have merged with technology. We're no longer separate. Uh, many people can't, as you said to me earlier, can't go without their phone. There are, you know, clinics for people who were addicted. First off, no one's addicted to their phone. Can we stop saying that? It's, it's dangerous to say that. Um, and secondly, uh, as we move forward uh, through the next 10 years, there won't be phones to look at. Right? There are no iPhones in 10 years. Right? Replay this interview in 2028. No one's holding a phone looking at it. You know, it's on their body, it's in their body, you know, or it's, in the, it's literally in their body. Uh, as, we, as we move further f forward, we need to find the best ways to save or back up humanity and bring that into the systems we're merging with. Mm -hmm. Does it scare you sometimes? Absolutely. There are days where I'm horrified when I look at the youth uh, my husband is a school teacher, and I look at their ability to what I would call think um, or their ability to communicate. They seem distracted. They seem lost. Uh, they seem utterly confused by everything that I would consider to be normal human behavior, and that scares me. The reality is if I'm more patient, I notice they have new ways of doing things that I don't understand. Mm -hmm. You travel around quite a bit yes, and talk about these things. Um, is it like the same things we're talking about, the same problems um, with technologies that we have around the world, you'd say? Yes. No matter where I go in the world, it, it's, it's become the same. I think the most provocative thing I've noticed is, if you think about it, all 7 billion people, for the most part, have been looking at the same screen for five years. So what we're doing is all over the world, we're seeing similar problems, governments, politics. It's not that something is spreading. It's just that our ability to be human is being constrained by the interface, the interface being the screen. So for example, up until three years ago, we only had two emotions on Facebook. Now we have five, right? So as technology companies start to give humanity more access to feelings, we'll start to see this. But right now, it's a very dark time. It doesn't matter if I'm in Singapore, Tokyo, Stockholm, Oslo, or South America. The problems are the same. People are reacting identically. Culturally, we're losing our kind of heritages, and we're, we're creating a new emergent heritage, a global heritage. It's very fascinating and exciting and scary sometimes. Thank you so much. Thank you.